when you're solving for the amount of the daughter in terms of the present amount of the parent, that's the underlying equation here. Notice the sign on the exponential changes. You swap the spots with the one and the E, okay? The other important thing here is that the slope of this relationship is E to the lambda one T minus one. This means that for a constant age, for a known parent decay constant, you're gonna have a linear line if you plot several different sample data points on your graph here. If you have some of the daughter present initially, that just raises the equation, that raises the line up on the graph. And your y-intercept, instead of being zero here, becomes this n2. And if you wanted to solve all of this for the time, so if you have a graph and you're trying to solve for the age of the sample, then that's this equation here. If there is no initial daughter, then this term on the top, the n2 naught, would of course be zero. So then that goes away. And then you're just looking at the ratio of the daughter and the parent atoms. And sometimes P and N are used for parent and daughter, or P and D are used for parent and daughter. You can see N or P for the parent. So those graphs in 19, those straight lines, when you plot them, when you look at the amount of daughter versus the amount of parent, those are known as isochrons. And I looked for some sort of fun image for isochrons and I found this uh, illustration from a magic card. So there it is, just kind of fun. When you get these straight lines, when you have a bunch of samples from um, a strata, from a rock layer, and you look at them and you're, you're making the assumption maybe that they're all the same age, when you plot the amount of daughter versus the amount of parent, you end up getting a straight line if they are indeed all the same age. It's just that some minerals are going to incorporate more of the parent and the daughter and other minerals are going to incorporate less of the parent and the daughter when they're formed. The minerals that incorporate more of the parent are going to form more of the daughter as they decay. The minerals that incorporated none of the parent are not going to form any more daughter because there's no parent there that can decay to the daughter. You can plot these as absolute numbers of atoms or you can plot them as ratios to some sort of an internal standard. All of the points on the plot, one of the assumptions is that they're co-genetic, the materials are created at the same time and place. And of course, again, we already mentioned if different minerals incorporate different amounts of parent or daughter, they can shift the line a little bit, but you'll, that's how you get the different points on the plot. So you took some granite, you took some quartz, and you looked for something that was embedded in both of those, and you got two different points on a plot, and you can create an isochron, okay? When you do this kind of dating, and you're trying to create these isochrons and look at your samples. And we're not gonna break out for this, but this goes along with 26 if you're trying to answer the handout as we go. The assumptions are that the sample has not gained or lost any parent or daughter atoms except through natural radioactive decay. That the decay constant of the parent is independent of time, so it doesn't change and it's not affected by physical conditions and is known accurately that when you do this, you use an appropriate value of the original amount of daughter, which typically you get from the graph, but sometimes if the graph is not a super straight line, then you have to make some assumptions about what the original amount of stable daughter would have been. And that when you measure the values of daughter and parent, they are accurate and representative, not just of the sample, not just of the mineral that you're measuring, but also of the la layer of rock, the strata that you're looking at. So what are some problems you see with these assumptions? Is there anything you can think of that would change these? Is there a uh, particular... Parent might not 
just decay to a stable daughter, you might decay to. Right. And so if the daughter is not stable, then some of these assumptions are not going to work and you're going to have to use a different mathematical system to approach it. What about types of decays? Is there a type of decay you know of where the decay constant may not be constant and can depend on physical conditions? One type of decay where the react everything on the reactant side is not just the parent. There's something else reacting with the parent in a particular radio electron capture. Electron capture. Electron capture. So if you are somehow able to strip the electrons, of course, that's not really going to happen in a rock. But if you have higher pressures and you can squeeze those electrons in a little bit more closely to the nucleus, you could actually accelerate the rate of electron capture. So we do not use nuclides that undergo electron capture to do radio dating because the decay constant is not so constant, okay? But alpha decay, beta minus decay, these things are okay. What else could happen that might change this besides the daughter being radioactive? Thinking about rocks and thinking about stuff in the earth. Would it be a situation where you had another parent that the daughter was that parent, does that make sense? So you're generating more of the parent from another decay chain. I see. So the parent itself is being formed from something before it. Yeah, right. sure. And then geologically, the thing I'm trying to get at really is what happens if you've got temperature changes? So we've got igneous rocks that form from molten lava, stuff crystallizes out. That's the first point here on this plot, really, right here. You form different minerals that incorporate different amounts of the parent. So biotite, feldspar, rock, apatite, these are all different types of minerals. The apatite you can see doesn't really incorporate any of the parent because it's got a pretty flat line here on our isochron, okay? Um, which isn't really an isochron notice because now we've changed our axes. So now we're looking at, looking at this in terms of time. When you've got igneous rock and it, undergoes pressure changes, heat changes, you can have metamorphosis. So if you have some sort of a metamorphic event where that rock, everything in that rock, all the different minerals remelt, then you're gonna have this uh, re-equilibration of the elements in those rocks. And when you look now at the current time, you're basically gonna end up with the wrong age of your sample. And I'll clear these. When I, you already have the slide, so it doesn't matter. Um, what you see here, you see these different angled lines on this time ratio graph because, because these different minerals incorporate different amounts of the parent. And so the more of the radioactive parent you have compared to your internal standard initially, the steeper the slope is gonna be on these, on these lines but you can use this kind of like the isochrons where you can look at different minerals and work backwards to see what the ages are, okay? Um, because different minerals incorporate different amounts or ratios of the parent and daughter at formation, then um, you might not necessarily have constant amounts in all your minerals, especially of the daughter. If you've got different kinds of chemistry for the, the host and the, um, the uh, included element. And metamorphic events can also cause these to fail. And so here is um, the Duluth Gabbro in Minnesota, this plot here. And these different minerals have different melting points. And so you can see the mineral that has the highest melting point is going to give you the best age close to wherever this metamorphic event occurred. But the further away you go from the event, some of these other minerals still give you good ages. But some of these minerals like biotite are gonna melt pretty close in to wherever the metamorphic event occurred. And so you can't just date a strata in one location and assume that that's gonna give you the right age for that strata all around the earth. And what happens here is that when you have this heat, this melting, especially in this system, this potassium argon system, argon's a gas. 
If it's formed inside the mineral, it's going to be trapped. But when you have a metamorphic event, that argon is a gas and it's going to get lost. If you lose the daughter, then that's going to make it seem like your sample is younger. Okay. So if you've already had some decay of the parent to the daughter, you lose some of that daughter that has formed, then when you do the dating here, these samples look like they're a billion years old when really they should be more like 2.6, 2.7 billion years old. So what this means is that there's a metamorphic event that occurred 1 billion years in the past that disturbed all of this rock in this area. And if it was an igneous intrusion, that molten rock coming up, that's enough to generate enough heat through the rest of the rock, where even though everything else doesn't melt, it still caused loss of that argon daughter because that's a gas. So, yeah, question? So how did they find, how do they find that out? How do they know that the argon was lost? Were they like comparing a different sample in a different area that showed yeah, so the paper this came from, they took rocks, they knew where the igneous intrusion was. So they could measure the distance from that intrusion and they took samples and they looked at the different minerals and that's how they came up with this plot. And when you connect all of the data points from a given mineral, that's that you end up with these sigmoidal curves. So they could see, and it also matched really well with like the melting points of the rocks, again, not that these minerals, not that these rocks were melting, but as they, if the melting point's really high, it's gonna be really hard for that argon gas to come out of it. Um, the lower the melting point, the easier it's gonna be for something like this feldspar to lose the argon. You can see even five kilometers away from the intrusion, the feldspar here still isn't giving accurate dates. So, um, you have to take a lot of samples, you have to take those samples over a large geographic region, and you have to be aware of the what's happened geologically within that space. So um, within the uranium thorium lead systems, this is 27 to 31, rather than splitting off, we're just gonna kind of work through these as a big group. So these are the starting points for the natural decay chains in nature. Uranium-238, uranium-235. Uranium-234 is included, but it's really part of the uranium-238 decay chain and thorium-232, okay? And all of these terminate in either lead or bismuth stable isotopes, even though now we know bismuth-209 really isn't as stable as we thought it was. Um, so looking at question 27, because that's the one that really applies here. If we look at 27, in secular equilibrium, if the parent and daughter are both radioactive, what equation is going to relate the amounts, the numbers of atoms of the parent and the daughter? So in secular equilibrium, what is it that's actually equal between the parent and the daughter, assuming that the parent and the daughter are both radioactive? Activity. The activities. So for 27, what you want to do is you want to write, on 27, you would start out maybe by writing activity of one equals activity of two. And the activity of one is going to be defined as lambda one and one. And the activity of two is going to be lambda two and two. That's gonna to have to be true if the parent and the daughter are in secular equilibrium. Now with everything in the natural decay chains, even though the decay chains are very long, if they're all in secular equilibrium, all of the intermediates are in secular equilibrium, then that means that the activity or the rate of decay of everything from the parent all the way down the chain all those activities are equal. So this is going to be equal to lambda 3 and 3. This is going to be equal to lambda 4 and 4. Oops, not an equals there. Equals, etc. Okay. So what could you say then for the formation of lead compared to the rate of decay of uranium? The formation of lead is going to have to be equal to 
the rate of decay of the uranium. So D lead DT equals lambda U and U for uranium, okay? And even though several intermediates occur between the uranium-238 and the lead-206, then you can still think through and say, okay, well, we know now that this N2 equals N1 E lambda 1 T minus 1 where N2 would be the lead 206, and N1 would be the uranium 238. Would that lambda be a combination of all the lambdas or would it just be lambda? It's just the, uh, I mean, if you're thinking about all the different ways the uranium-238 can decay or anything in the middle, it's really just the uranium-238, the overall decay constant of the uranium-238. So all the other decay constants in the chain are going to be smaller. No, are going to be larger because they're more likely to decay because they have shorter half-lives. Okay. So it's kind of like the rate limiting one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the uranium decay is the slow step. <laughs> so really kind of what we see, I want to condense this a little bit more, show it a little bit neater through some of these other steps. We get this first equation here with the lead 206. If you have some stable lead 206 present initially, then that gets added into that equation, okay? Lead 204 does not come from radioactive decay, at least in terms of the natural decay chains. And so we can use lead 204 as an internal standard. So we could divide or we could look for the lead 206 compared to the lead 204, and the uranium 238 compared to the lead 204. And so we could write that out as well using internal standards sometimes can give you better results. And you could go through this also for the other chronometers that you can use. So uranium-235 pairs with lead-207. And thorium-232 pairs with lead-208. And then just like the equation for time in 24, 22, you can end up with this one over lambda times the natural log of the ratios, okay? If the initial amount here, if there's no stable lead 206 when you start, then that goes away, that simplifies, okay? What happens here is that we can still plot these isochrons. Now here we've got these ratios. So this is the ratio of the the daughter to the parent. They're plotted here as internal standards. And notice they give us pretty straight lines, okay? There are a few points in this thorium lead plot that are a little bit off of the line, that are maybe a little bit suspect, okay? There are a lot of points here on this lead 206 uranium 238 plot that are off, way off the line. What that signifies is that the uranium has been lost. So something's happened, maybe some sort of chemical weathering or chemical erosion. And some of the uranium has been removed, but the lead that came from it has been left behind. And then we see this lead 207 and lead 206. This is now kind of a relationship between the uranium 235 and the uranium 238 but we're using the lead 207 and the lead 206 as stand-ins. But the nice thing with the first and the third plots is we get 2.79 and 2.75 billion years old for these samples, okay? 
the reference line here for the middle plot shows us where those points should be if they're about the same age and shows us that in that case, some of the uranium was lost. Whereas this sample retained the thorium and the lead. So sometimes even if one chronometer has been um, disturbed, you can still have enough other elements present to figure out what's going on. So, Concordia are really kind of what we apply these equations with. We can use isochrons, they're good, but what about much older stuff? What about um, smaller numbers of samples maybe? And so this is what they came up with to do for the moon rocks um, or starting on the moon rocks. Actually, yeah, that's the next one. So Weatherall's Concordia, Concordia literally means harmony. And instead of plotting um, the daughter versus the parent, if you reverse these ratios and plot the um, lead 206 versus uranium 238 and plot the lead 207 versus uranium 235, you can create these curved plots. The nice thing with these curved plots is that this then is known as the Concordia. So if you started with a sample of uranium, maybe I should switch from red for my ink color. You start with a sample of uranium, you're not gonna have any lead present initially. As the uranium-238 decays to lead-206, as the uranium-235 decays to the lead-207, those are gonna grow in, okay? So as you grow in, you move along this curve. So let's say that you get somewhere up here to around two and a half billion years. And then some sort of an event happens. Well, that event is gonna spread that material out between there and the origin. And that's really bad as a straight line, but it's gonna do it along a straight line rather than the curve, rather than the Concordia. But then as this material ages further, the point here that's not disturbed is going to keep moving up the Concordia. The point here that makes it all the way back to the origin where you lose all of the lead is going to stay on the Concordia. All of these other points that are somewhere here on this straight line, and I have a better plot on the next slide, those are going to generate their own Concordias. They're going to move in a curved trend but they're going to retain the straight line so that there will still be a straight line here between three and a half and one. And that's really what, what is what is meant by going back to the origin? Because I know you don't mean literally going back in time. So what is meant by that? You lose all of that lead that was created by the radioactive decay. So maybe it melts and the mineral reforms and that mineral doesn't incorporate any of that lead again. So that particular sample ends up all the way back on that zero point. But that's this part, point here, or this graph here, where you get all the way up to two and a half, okay? But that sample, that rock sample, a part of it melts, part of it doesn't, part of it like melts and loses all the lead. So you end up with these points here along this straight line between two and a half billion years and zero billion years. Those points move along their own Concordia. Those samples move along their own Concordia. They basically continue to go through radioactive decay. And at the present time, all of those points would still lie along a straight line And that straight line is going to intersect your Concordia at 3.5 and 1 billion years. And so what that means is that the sample overall is three and a half billion years old. But some sort of an event happened to it 1 billion years ago that disturbed it. So that helps you figure out what's going on geologically. So I didn't want to draw all the curves in because it gets kind of 
messy. But each of these points, each of these blue points here on this line that goes to the origin, each of them individually starts to move along a curve, just like the Concordia that's already shown here. They still maintain their linear relationship where the sample up here didn't lose any lead when it was disturbed. And the sample down here lost all of the lead when it was disturbed. And all these points in the middle lost some lead, maybe a little bit, maybe a lot, okay? Down here would have lost a lot, but not all. Up here would only have lost a little bit. So you're gonna get a Concordia and you're going to get some straight, have some points on there in a straight line, and you just have to know how to read it. You're not going to have to do the math to create the Concordia, okay? These are used as a way of interpreting the data. Now, I mentioned moon, ro moon rocks. When they did the moon rocks, they found that they were making their measurements in a different way, and it was a little bit better to rearrange the Concordia. And so the Terra and Wasserberg is really the inverse on the x-axis of the Wetherill's Concordia. And it includes the currently accepted isotopic ratio. And again, the transcendental values mean that we really have to tabulate values to create a graph. So this is what the graph looks like. And you still read it the same way, where you're going to have points that form a straight line and those points that form that straight line, that's known as the discordia because it's not along the curve. But where those intersect, the highest time they intersect is the age, overall age of the sample. And the shortest time where they intersect is the last event that caused a disturbance in the material. Okay. So for the line that's plotted on here, this sample would be 3.2 billion years old and it had some sort of disturbance 200 million years ago. So if we're looking at this and we're trying to figure out, well, how old is the earth? We want to look for some of the oldest rocks on the earth. And when we look at types of rocks, when we look at minerals, felsic rocks are igneous rocks. They're formed from molten rock. They're rich in feldspar and quartz. They're lighter in color than mafic rocks. Um, may, you may have seen some stuff here with like granite countertops and stuff like that. Um, they are 70% about in silicon dioxide or silicates. So they're enriched in silicon and oxygen and sodium and potassium. Because they're enriched in these silicon and oxygen, they're enriched in these silicates, that means they're very likely to form minerals called zircons. These are very hard, generally chemically inert. They're found commonly in felsic formations, but they can also be weathered out of and carried through sedimentation processes. So you can also find whole zircons that have been deposited into sedimentary rocks as they've been eroded away from their um, felsic hosts, their original hosts. When you look at the grains, you can see here in this SEM, you see all these little boundary layers all these little lines, and the blue doesn't show up so well on here. All of those boundary layers are associated with this zircon having some thermal changes over time where it still retained its shape, but different events occurred. The edges here are gonna have had the most disturbance, whereas the center here is gonna have had the least disturbance. And so you can look at these zircon grains and you can look at the grains to discover a lot about what's happened to these materials over time. One of the instruments you use to do this is called a shrimp or a secondary high resolution ion microprobe. You focus an oxide ion beam onto the sample, five to 30 micron spot size, so you can see where you're shooting on the zircon grain, so you can actually sample from different parts, different sections of the grain. That then causes secondary ions to be ejected from the zircon grain. Those are accelerated. Those are separated through the electrostatic and the analyzer and the magnetic sector or a double sector mass spec. You could also use laser ablation for this instead of using the um, ion microprobes, but the ion microprobes are generally um, 
more accurate. Um, ta -da -da. So some rocks that they've done this with, some zircons they found in the Acastanese, which is up in Canada, in the Northwest Territories. They uh, looked at zircons from Felsic, Orthogenesis, Orthonis, and uh, looking at the different types of grains here, that's what that key means. And they're only zooming in here on a part of the Concordia. Which Concordia is this, by the way? Is this the Terra Wasserberg or is this the Wetherills? What kind of Concordia are they showing you here? Terra Wasserberg. Terra Wasserberg, because of the shape, okay? And again, notice it has an intercept around 4 billion years. So the interpretation for this is that um, it was about a 4,002 million year old igneous rock. It happens to contain a little bit of material from about 4,065 million years ago. But then the whole thing underwent metamorphosis around 3,730 years. And that's, it's not showing up so well on here, um, but that, that's this line here for these points, okay? Um, here's a slightly more complex sample. Looks like it's about a 4,012 million year or four, just over 4 billion year old rock. It had a major metamorphic event around 3,611 million years old. There were other events affecting some of the grains at around 3.75 billion years. And then not shown on here, there were other events with this sample at 1.7 and 1 billion years ago as well, okay? So on the Earth, the oldest stuff we can see are really these zircons, these grains that we can find in both um, igneous deposits, but also that we can find sometimes in sedimentary deposits. And so the Acastanese in Canada, switching back to red, up in here, that part of Canada, gives us a few different ages, just over 4 billion years old. I didn't show the third one, I only showed you guys two of these. These match to the Hadean, Priscoan, Pre-Archaean ages for Earth, around Earth's formation being about 4 billion years old. Uh, current theories are that there was an intense meteoric bombardment of the young Earth between four and a half and four billion years ago. And so the surface of the Earth would have still been molten around that time. You, we wouldn't have been able to, it wouldn't have formed zircon grains at that time until it cooled down enough where they could form. Um, but even though it was molten, there were some zircons still that survived. And there are a few zircon grains that have been found in sedimentary rocks in the Jack Hills of Australia and they've been dated to just over 4.4 billion years old. So that's about as old as we can find on the Earth. So maybe we can look somewhere else to kind of figure out um, kind of like what the oldest age the Earth could be is. And so if we look out in space, we can find meteorites. And meteorites, when they cool in space, they cool over very long times. They get these very big crystal patterns. These are called Wittmann-Staten patterns or Thomson structures. They're nickel iron crystals. The Holtzinger meteorite, which is the largest fragment of the meteor that created meteor crater. We can look at these because they came from space and we can basically get kind of like an upper limit on the age of the earth. And so if the meteorites formed and cooled in space around the same time as the solar system, even though there are a few that have been found that are older, that they didn't that didn't melt during the formation of the solar system. Most of them are going to be the same age as the solar system. Most meteorites remain in space until they've fallen relatively recently. And so those meteorites have been able to avoid the cycling of rock that would normally occur on the Earth through erosion or through tectonics. Um, 
So when we look at the meteorites that come from space, these kind of give us an upper limit on the age of the Earth. And the Canyon Diablo meteorite was dated to just over four and a half billion years old. And a more recent measurement of calcium aluminum inclusions, again, gave about 4.568 billion years old. So really what that leads to is, that leads us to the accepted age of the Earth is 4.54 billion years old, which funny enough matches pretty much the half-life of uranium-238. So presently on the Earth, we have about half of the uranium-238 that would have been on the Earth when the Earth first formed in the solar system. And this is the final slide, just a couple other pairs you could use. You wanna to try to choose your dating pair, your chronometer, to match the age of the thing you're trying to date. So if we're trying to date the age of the Earth, that's why we really like the uranium-238 lead-206 system, okay? The thorium-232 system isn't too bad. That half-life, at least relatively, is still kind of on the same order of magnitude. It's only about three times longer than the age of the Earth. Um, you can date other rocks that are younger rocks. You can date them using this potassium-argon system. You can date really old stuff from space using this rubidium strontium system. And then there's all these other pairs here. There are tons of things you could use for this, but one of the keys is that you're looking for a parent. As we said earlier with the assumptions, you're looking for a parent that is not itself being formed from radioactive decay. And you're looking for a daughter or a termination of the decay chain that is stable. Um, and that doesn't have other sources. So that's not com itself coming from other types of decays or neutron activation or something like that. So that's um, pretty much this lecture on rocks and dating and radio dating. Thanks for uh, sticking through the math stuff and stopping the recording.